studio in New York City. I'm Julie Hyman, that's Josh Lipton, and this is Yahoo Finance Live. Here's what we're watching this afternoon. We're an hour away from the closing bell on Wall Street and investors are on edge. Stocks are under pressure and tech is the worst performer thanks to NVIDIA. Shares of the high-flying chip maker coming down to earth just one day ahead of its highly anticipated earnings report. Plus, a busy day of deals on Wall Street. Capital One acquiring Discover Financial for $35 billion. That is the biggest deal so far this year. And Walmart making a play in the advertising space by buying Vizio for nearly $3 billion. We're taking a closer look at all the deals and what it means for your portfolio. And the electric vehicle price war entering its second year. Now it's Ford slashing prices on its Mustang Mach-E as the automaker faces falling demand for its EV lineup. Let's get you up to speed on the market action now and the latest that we are seeing here for the major averages. This downdraft that we are seeing is indeed being led by technology. The Infotech index within the S&P 500, the worst performer here. It is being counterbalanced to some extent by consumer staples and a gain in shares of Walmart, for example. We'll get to that a little bit later on. Consumer discretionary, though, is also lower today along with energy shares. That's sending the Dow lower by about 34 points, but there's a real gap today between the Dow and the NASDAQ. The NASDAQ down 1.1%, the Dow only down a tenth of 1%, and the S&P in the middle down about six tenths of 1%. You know what I think we should talk about today? Let's talk about all the deals. Deals, deals, because we got a big one. Let's start with that. Capital One buying Discover. This is a $35 billion all stock deal, Julie. This would create, I'm reading here, the largest US credit card company by a loan volume. In terms of tie lo- timeline, expected to complete later this year, perhaps early 2025. Uh, Capital One holders will own about 60% of the combined company. Now, whether it actually gets done, whether regulator- regulators really approve it, green light it, you know, we'll wait and see. But certainly we've had a few deals now, which is good news for deal makers. Yeah, it's a good news good news for deal makers. And there are also implications maybe for the overall market vibe. Is this good for market confidence, for example? That's something uh, that we can dig into. According to Bloomberg figures, if you look at the announced deals globally this year, we're looking at $425 billion, which is up 55% year over year for the same period of time. Over at Deal Logic, we got them to crunch the numbers as well, looking at large deals exclusively, about $277 billion worth of deals announced just in the U.S. this year. And if you look at deals overall, we're looking at the highest number in terms of deal value being announced since 2021. So anecdotally, yes, it feels like there are more deals. And it turns out there are actually mm. more deals and larger deals that have pushed that deal value up this day, uh, this year so far. And what's also interesting is, you know, there have been a lot of predictions that deal, the deals were going to come back. But it has happened maybe a little bit more quickly than had been anticipated. Does this also tell us something about how comfortable companies are with the stability of the interest rate cycle, for example, Mm -hmm. perhaps. Um, But it's just an interesting development to watch. Yeah, if you ask me though, Julie, if you ask me like, how do you think the M&A market's really gonna shake out this year? I I don't know if I could, take a strong bet because as you were saying there's certain tailwinds like you know we talk about um the end of the fed's rate hiking yeah. campaign we think uh strong equity markets but on the other hand if you were ceo and you're just looking at all the uncertainty still about the economy and geopolitical conflict and elections and also just a tougher regulatory backdrop i mean even this deal you know capital one discover you're, you're going to get regulators right. kicking the tires yes. on that for sure. Yeah. Well, let's yeah. talk about that. Yeah. Let's dig into the details of this deal in particular because it is such a big one. Capital One's planned purchase of Discover would combine two of the largest credit card companies in the U.S. With more, we're joined by Yahoo Finance's Alexis Keenan and David Hollerith. David, let's start with you. Give us sort of the details on this deal and what kind of company is going to result. Yeah, so what we're looking at, and obviously uh, regulators do need to approve this deal, but we're looking at um, what would effectively be a new uh, financial consumer banking giant um, in the U.S., Um, and it's a $35.3 billion uh, all-stock transaction deal. And the all-stock is is a pretty uh, important thing to point out, too, as as of Discover's closing stock price on Friday, it's actually... Uh, getting sort of a 26% premium to this. Um, Capital One stock uh, 
also to sort of in context to uh, you know the larger banking sector, its stock actually performed fairly well last year too. Um, so together, these two banks would make uh, the sixth largest bank by deposits and total assets. And by credit card loans, it would be the largest bank. Um, that being said, uh, some really um, important parts to this are whether or not um, Capital One would be able to um, make use of Discover's credit card network. Uh, Discover is the, has the fourth largest uh, U.S. credit card network. That's after Visa, MasterCard, and American Express. And it's actually much smaller than those other three. But the fact that Capital One is also such a large issuer means that uh, it could put its weight, its customers, move it over to the Discover's network, and then potentially have a lot of cost savings there. There's also a lot of cost savings associated to the amount of marketing expenses that both credit card banks spend per year, and also the fi fixed costs, uh, like technology expenses for anti-fraud kinds of things. So there's a lot of hope there, obviously. The the company has given out a $2.7 billion dollar um, pre-tax uh, cost uh, synergies, I guess you, you could call it. Um, so it, it really depends on what regulators think, but we do have to imagine that they have had conversations with regulators at this point leading up to this. So now I guess we're kind of waiting to see on that. All right, Alexis, let's bring you here as well as we wait for regulators. You know, we heard from one lawmaker already, Alexis, uh, Senator Warren posted on X, doesn't sound happy, Alexis, saying this deal would be bad for competition. So what are antitrust experts telling you? Yeah, yeah, she's not happy uh, with this proposed deal. But look, the head of the DOJ's antitrust division, Jonathan Cantor, he promised last year some banking merger scrutiny. So we're going to expect a full review of this deal. But legal experts tell me that they think this one is ultimately going to result in no formal challenges from regulators. The major reason is that this horizontal merger would not create a monopoly in the markets that we're concerned with here. Capital One holds approximately 10% of card balances with discovered about 8% of card balances. So that 18% is really well below that market dominance level that is of concern to antitrust regulators. Now, despite that the merge firm would have more cards than their rivals, they just ultimately wouldn't have that monopoly position. Now, here though, it's kind of interesting. There are two different markets at issue for regulators at least. You have the card issuing side, that's that retail side. And then you also have the card processing networks. And it's that card issuing business that the legal experts think is going to pose the most scrutiny. Uh, it's going to get the most look at from these regulators. And that's because that's where you'd see that market increase despite it not rising to maybe a monopolistic level. Though on the card processing side, that current market rival where you have as David was saying, their Discover, Visa, MasterCard, and then to a lesser extent, Amex, because that's really a closed network system. Um, but this merger between Capital One and Discover, it really only risks on that processing side that Capital One would tap into Discover's network. So they would be kind of just moving over to have a new processor rather than dominating that market. So a lot to think about here. Certainly they are going to kick the tires and they're going to kick them hard, guys. Yeah, and the stocks seem to be trading as though investors are assuming that this deal does have a likelihood of going through. Thanks so much to you both, David and Alexis. For more on the latest in deal making and the implications for the market moving forward and just the market more broadly, let's welcome in Jay Hatfield, Infrastructure Capital Advisor CEO. Jay, I do want to zoom out uh, in a moment and talk about macro items and the Fed, but first, I do want to get your take on this uptick in deal activity um, and sort of how investors should be thinking about it. Is there a way for them to play it or is there a message maybe that all these deals are sort of sending market participants? Thanks, Julie and Josh for having me on again. Well, we've been bullish for about six months on this year for investment banking activity. And the primary indicator for all investment banking activity, not just M&A, but also offerings. Offerings have been strong as well this year. You had great data on M&A, but also particularly on the credit side, very, very strong. And really low volatility, it doesn't have to be rock bottom low, but below 20, 
that sets us up well for more uh, M&A and equity offerings because management teams want to have successful deals. So they don't want to go into a crashing market. They don't want to misprice deals. And also the buy side, we're on the buy side. We don't want to take down deals that might crack the next day because the market's unhinging. So I would look to low volatility. So we are very bullish about the investment banking market. And we think that's very, very positive for a lot of the money center banks. Interesting. So positive for the banks. And do you think that there are positive implications for the market overall, that there's this level of confidence and it, it, not just that these are going to be good investments, but also that there is going to be a level of stability perhaps in rates this year or predictability? Or are these defensive moves because of the lack of predictability? Well, I think in terms of corporations, they're satisfied with no more hikes they can operate into this environment, particularly in the U.S., because we have a very strong economy. And there's really little debate as to whether we'll have cuts. And I don't think to major, it might matter to me and you know, stock traders where we have four cuts or three cuts or two cuts, but they're comfortable that there's going to be global cuts. We're much more confident about Europe. We're predicting June for Europe. So we think that's a perfect environment for corporations to raise capital and also uh, pursue their consolidation objectives. And Jay, let, let's stick with the Fed and their their rate hiking cycle here, Jay. Just interested to get your take. You know, inv inflation may be cooling, Jay, but maybe it's just, it's slower than a lot of investors expected. W when do you expect the Fed to start cutting, Jay? Is, is it June or, you know, is it later in the back half of the year? And, and how does that timeline kind of impact and influence how you want to put money to work? Thanks, Josh. Well. We're quite bearish about the Fed rate cuts. We're projecting August, which I haven't heard, and we are short in our hedge fund, short Fed fund futures up until August. So we have a bet on that as well. <clears throat> but the reason for that is not because we believe inflation's accelerating, but unfortunately in the US, we have a lot of very strange methods for estimating inflation. Everybody knows about the, the archaic shelter calculation. What they haven't focused on is we had a annualized 30% increase in financial services inflation, which, you know, from my perspective, I wish that were true, but the only, we didn't raise our rates, but what happens is when the stock market rallies, that gets counted as inflation. So we think that a PCE is going to print at 0.5, in other words, not roll down at all, so not go down year over year. We think the Fed needs to get to 2.5. That could take this six months. So based on that, you should just sell the market, as you were kind of indicating, there's a lot of risk out there. But I already mentioned it, but the Eurozone doesn't have any strange ways of calculating inflation. They just, they have much more straightforward methodology. They don't have this strange financial services element. And their inflation is going to go sub two almost certainly. They're rolling off these gigantic numbers, don't have distortions they're entering into a pretty significant contraction. So that is deflationary. So their picture is more clear. And that's why we wouldn't overfade the rally right now. I mean, we're cautious, but we wouldn't just sell everything because we think that we will get this summer rally. And, and speaking of not selling everything, let's talk about some of the things you do like. You mentioned the money center banks, and I believe in particular, you like Morgan Stanley and Goldman Sachs, which if there's going to be an uptick in deals and offerings, in theory, they would be poised to benefit from that. Um, is there more to your bull case? Are you looking for other sources of upside for them? Well, yes, there's a nuance to it that you know I appreciate because I worked, I actually worked at Morgan Stanley, but worked on Wall Street. And when you're inside of it, what you realize is that an investment banking deal is not just good for the investment banking department. It's phenomenal for sales and trading because it generates a lot of activity. And if you if the salespeople allocate deals, then there's usually flow that comes back. And it's also positive for wealth management uh, because they get deals and that gets credit to them. In fact, everybody was disappointed about Morgan Stanley's wealth management last quarter, but it was really because there was very few offerings. And then if we're right about the market going into the 5,500 to 6,000 range, that's also good for asset management, you know, for the same reason that the Fed thinks inflation is going up. Or the, or the BLS, because AUM just rises with the market. 
So these large investment banks are the perfect bull market financial security. Interesting. Jay, great to catch up with you as always. Appreciate it. Great. Thanks, Julie. We're just getting started here on Yahoo Finance Live. Coming up, the semiconductor sector taking a hit today ahead of NVIDIA's second quarter earnings tomorrow. We're going to be talking chips on the other side and shares of Walmart and Home Depot moving on the back of their latest quarterly results. We're going to speak to experts about the retail giants later on in the hour. Also, the newest edition of our series, Goodbye or Goodbye. We'll get analyst insight to break down two stocks and help you make the best choices for your portfolio. Stay tuned. We've got more after this. Checking in on some of today's top trending tickers. Let's start with Super Microcomputer here. They're sliding in today's trade along with some of the other big chip companies is coming despite one Wall Street analyst raising the price target on the stock. Rosenblatt's Hans Mosesman increased his price target on Super Microcomputer to 1300 from 700 while maintaining his buy rating. So, Julie, the biggest bull on the street right now, it's official. Team at Rosenblatt, they go to 1300 for the server maker. They say it's going to keep benefiting from the AI boom, basically. And the money line here, I think, is key to the story they tell their clients is for investors to consider that the company is benefiting not only from secular AI growth, but material share gains, too. And stock's slipping a bit today, but it's still up about 700% in the past yeah, 12 months. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it's interesting if you look at the whole chip space today, because being led by NVIDIA downward, even ahead of its earnings tomorrow. And as we've talked about, I don't think we have talked to a single 
analyst, even among people who follow the industry very, very closely, who are not bullish on NVIDIA. <laughs> Nearly everyone is. But there was an interesting yeah. note that someone shared with me from JP Morgan today that said of NVIDIA, yeah. clients are either in, already in the stock or they won't chase the pop and they've resigned themselves to looking elsewhere within the chip industry. Certainly, um, you know, Supermicro has been one of those companies that has benefited from that. JP Morgan also mentioned stocks like Broadcom and TSMC as potential beneficiaries or other places that people are looking right now. And there, it, we are in this interesting period mm. where, you know, NVIDIA has been a rocket ship and for those lucky enough to be riding it, they're yeah. quite happy. And others are just sort of trying to figure out where to pick their spots right now. Yeah, it, it's showtime tomorrow for NVIDIA for sure. After Bell, the focus, of course, will be on the earnings and, and, of course, the guide for sure. Yes, most definitely. All right, let's get another ticker that's taking off today, so to oh, speak. Oh, nice. Yeah, nice. Shares yeah. of intuitive machines rising on positive reports that the progress of its Nova C lunar lander is expected to get to the moon this Thursday. That would be America's first soft landing on the moon in more than 50 years. The shares are spiking today. They have plunged, though, over the last year, though. Uh, but the company is aiming for a landing on Thursday, as you see the tweet there. Um, and so a lot of optimism being built into that potential landing. Yeah, not too many analysts on the street actually cover this one, by the way. Yeah. It's There's pretty not a small. Lot. It's it, about $300 million uh, yeah. market cap. Although those who do, generally bullish. Four buys, one hold, no sell. Average price target is eight seventy five. dollars Of course, as you know, the stock's moving higher today, but that was a, a very rough 2023. Team at Roth, MKM, by the way, did recently raise their yeah. target on this one to 15 from four, so meaningfully hiked it. Thinks investors, they say, will assign a higher multiple, reflecting increased confidence in future mission success. Yeah, there are there just aren't that many ways in the public markets right now to yeah. play the space thesis, pure play certainly. And so when you get one that's actually making a little bit of progress, you tend to get people jumping on it, but it we'll see if it sustains. Another ticker that's been trending today, Walmart stocks is rising after the retailer reported better than expected fourth quarter results. E-commerce sales, they jumped 23% year over year. Walmart CFO John David Rainey joined Yahoo Finance this morning and had this to say about the state of the consumer. We've seen that customers are continuing to be choiceful. They're using discretion with some of these larger ticket items. And when we look at the composition of the basket of, of when they're shopping with us, they're putting fewer items in that basket, but they're actually shopping with us more frequently. So that was interesting, Julie, uh, the word choiceful. They, he was, likes yeah. that word. Yeah. They like that, that word over <laughs> at Walmart. <laughs> so another, it sounds like they're saying, yes, resilient, but maybe being a little bit more selective, looking for value, yes, I exactly. guess. Which dovetails, I think, with kind of the softer guide they gave for the current fiscal year. They now forecast sales to grow between 3 and 4%. So perhaps indicating for Walmart execs, resilient now they see the consumer, but maybe they see some, and you can't blame them, uncertainty in the quarters ahead. Well, when they're being choiceful, they're choosing not to buy more expensive, higher margin items at yeah. Walmart, which is something that has uh, hit their margins in recent quarters, and it sounds like might continue to, at least in the short term, right? Mm -hmm. They're not buying, you know, when the company bought Vizio, right? Announced it was buying uh, Vizio here. Uh, that was the other big announcement yep. in the quarter for $2.3 billion dollars, they're not buying um, TVs and other higher price electronics. Their consumers aren't. Walmart, uh, according, and we're going to get to more into this in a moment, um, the company's advertising business was up 28% in the quarter. So that's something that they are looking to grow even further. Yeah, you, you have seen them sort of, that's kind of been their strategy, right? Kind of looking to expand the kind of non-retail, so advertising, mm -hmm. memberships, and trying to develop these you know, higher margin revenue streams. Yeah, well, Walmart delivering not only an upbeat quarter, but also announcing that acquisition of TV maker Vizio. The big box retailer looking to accelerate Walmart Connect in the U.S. as its global ad business saw a slight slowdown for the full, well, it didn't slow down, it grew at a slightly lower rate year over year. Uh, joining us now, Double Verify CEO Mark Zagorski to talk more about this. Hey, Mark, good to see you here. Um, what do you, you know, what is Walmart getting in this deal? What does, you know, for those of us who watch TV on TV still, you know, what, like, how does Walmart collect that information and that ad revenue based on that deal? Yeah, it's, first off, great being here again, Julie. Um, 
This is a really, really interesting uh, acquisition for Walmart because I think it combines two of the hottest trends in advertising today, retail media networks, which is expected to be $140 billion advertising business worldwide this year, um, and connected television, right? CTV, which is a $30 billion US business. Um, what they're getting here, forget about the TV sets, forget about devices of Vizio, what they're getting is data. And what that data is going to allow them to do is fuel that advertising business that you just mentioned, which grew over 20% last year. And that data is essential. When you can take a retail media network, combine it with the data that you can get from television viewing and CTV viewing, um, you've got a powerful combination. Amazon has seen that this year. Um, and I think what they're doing is really responding to uh, Amazon's launch of prime advertising because prime advertising is going to be a great CTV media application connect combined with a great data application that they have in their retail media uh, business. And, and Mark, so it sounds like generally speaking, you, you think this was a, a smart strategic move by Walmart. I'm just wondering what you think the, the kind of downside risk would be for an acquisition like this. Uh, you know, look, the risk always is there's other assets there they have to deal with. Vizio is a set manufacturer. Uh, I don't think Vizio makes a lot of money off the actual devices themselves. Where they're making money off of is data. Um, so you're going to have to carry that device business to get the data out of it. That being said, I think it's a small price to pay for a significant amount of uh, CTV advertising opportunity uh, that, again, that's where the dollars are going. I mean, if you look at linear TV ad spend, it's declining every year. Uh, connected TV ad spend is only growing. Um, and combining that with the retail data that they're getting from their online transactions, their store transactions, putting that together with a CTV business, a CTV data business, um, it's a powerful combo. So if you're an advertiser, um, are, which of these is more attractive? If you're looking at the Amazon offering or the Walmart offering, where most advertisers going to just you know, flood the zone and do both? I, I think there's room for both. Uh, you know, the, the one aspect that's obviously a little bit different here is Walmart has physical store data as well. So you're not just looking at online transactions, but the ability to capture physical store data uh, and location-based data with CTV viewership as well. So it adds a, a, another perspective, which I think, you know, if you're in the business of location-based selling and actual retail selling, um, it, it's pretty, pretty powerful. And Mark, I want to get your take on kind of a broader question too, just to get to a pulse check from you, Mark, on, on the online ad market. Just kind of what you're seeing right now, Mark, and how you see kind of evolving over 2024. We just heard from, you know, Meta and Alphabet. I, I would think, Mark, it would be a, a pretty strong year, just given, listen, you've got the Olymp Olympics, you've got the election, but but what are you seeing? Yeah, I think, I think it's certainly, you know, we've come into this year in a little bit better position as an industry than we did last year. Uh, I think that some of the ambiguity around interest rates has been cleaned up. Um, the concerns about recession, not that they're gone totally, um, but they look a bit better, I think, has given, you know, all advertisers a bit more looseness um, with what their spend's going to be. Now, no one's, you know, throwing a party right now, but if you look at general ad estimates from the big agency groups, um, they're all looking for a better year this year than we had last year. Mark, always great to have you on the show. Thanks so much for joining us. Appreciate it. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. And we move on. Home Depot shares, they are drifting lower today. That's after the retailer's 2024 outlook disappointed the street's expectations. CEO Ted Decker telling analysts on the earnings call that higher for longer interest rates are expected to weigh on consumer demand. But even with that near-term pressure on the industry, TD Cowan maintains an outperform rating on Home Depot stock. Joining us now is Max Riklenko, TD Cowan Director, Retail Luxury. Max, it's good to have you on the show. Maybe just to start, Max, listen, you've had time to look over the report. Give us just your reaction, your response to those results. Great. Thanks a lot for having me on this afternoon. So results for 4Q were broadly in line with expectations. Uh, same store sales came in a little bit above, as did EBIT margin compared to what Street was looking for. The 2024 outlook was a little bit softer. Uh, companies looking for same store sales down about 1%. We were looking for a little bit better. We think that the guide is broadly in line with what investors were looking for. We think that it's relatively conservative, uh, potentially setting up for beats and raises if the year shapes up a little bit better than expected. 
Um, overall, though, when you look at what's going on in the housing market, we keep getting data that's not terribly encouraging, right? So uh, overall, are we looking at a home improvement sector that, you know, it sounds like you're a little optimistic for upside, but right now we're seeing it under some pressure. Yeah, certainly. So we expect uh, the home improvement sector to decline low single digits in 2024. And then we do think that Home Depot picks up some market share. But overall, you're absolutely right. Despite uh, mortgage rates coming down by roughly 100 basis points, uh, looking at some of the real-time data, we haven't really seen any sort of a pickup in existing home sales whatsoever, just given such tight inventory. The hope is that inventory does pick up as the year goes on. And if we can get some rate cuts in the second half of the year, that should set up for a more favorable 2025. But in general, it is that sort of debate around uh, when will existing home sales pick up and then the lag. And then eventually we should see a little bit of an acceleration in uh, home improvement. And Max, I'm also interested, just, you know, you look at this stock. It's had a nice recent run, Max. It's up about 25% since early November. How does valuation look to you here? So valuation right now is a little stretched, uh, both compared to lows, uh, that relative multiple, as well as the S&P. Uh, we do see upside to where estimates are for the next several years. So we think as uh, top line and margins continue to recover, valuation will sort of get to a little bit more of a normalized level. But where we are sitting today, uh, it's certainly towards the higher end of the range. So if we're overall looking at a single double, single digit growth rate for home improvement and you got your Home Depot and you got your Lowe's, which one should investors be looking to add in that environment? Sure. So we prefer Home Depot to Lowe's. One of the top reasons why we prefer that is, especially in the near term, Home Depot has a lot more exposure to the professional channel. So at Home Depot, Pro is about 50% of sales. At Lowe's, it's only about... 25% of sales. So therefore, as we model 2024, we do expect better trends at Home Depot because that pro market does actually remain more resilient than what we've seen in DIY. In DIY, the real problem is the discretionary big ticket purchases. Uh, people are really pulling back on it. Uh, you spoke previously to higher rates uh, as well as some of the other consumer headwinds. So we expect for the pro business to continue to outperform. And with that, we do expect better trends in 2024 at Home Depot than Lowe's. Max, thanks so much for joining us today. We appreciate it. Great. Thanks for having me on. And coming up, the newest edition of our series, Goodbye or Goodbye. We'll get insight to help you make the best choices for your portfolio. And today, we're taking a closer look at industrials. Stay tuned. More Yahoo Finance after this.
It's a big, noisy universe of stocks out there. Welcome to Goodbye or Goodbye. Our goal to help cut through that noise to navigate the best moves for your portfolio. Today, we're taking a look at two major American machine makers. Joining me here with how to play these cyclical stocks is Al Root, Barron's senior writer. Good to see you. Thanks for coming in. Thanks, Julie. So let's get to your buy stock, first of all. And it is Deer, the farm equipment giant. Of course, when you're talking about Deer, a lot of what you talk about has to do with the farming cycle, right? Mm -hmm. And the income that farmers are bringing in and how much they're willing to spend. So where are we in that cycle? You think close to a bottom, maybe. Well, you hit on it. These are two cyclical companies. And at this point, uh, farmers are not doing as well as they were. Corn prices are down about 30 to 5 to 40% year over year. Farm income is projected in 24 by our great USDA to be about 115 billion. That's down from two years ago mm. from a peak of about 185 billion. So that means less spending on farm equipment and things like that. But when you're getting close to a trough, that of course is a good thing for cyclical stocks. One of the interesting things that's been happening in farming too is a lot of technology being right. brought into the industry with what's called precision farming. How is deer sort of benefiting from that? So this is things like self-driving tractors, uh, computers planting seeds at a perfect depth, uh, better, more targeted applications of pesticides and fertilizers so you use less that's a cost saving, it's a better for the environment. If you remember, uh, CNH, uh, Deer Peer bought Raven, Agco just did a joint venture with Trimble. This is sort of a big deal with the industry. This is about partly about selling recurring revenue, subscriptions for these types of services. Deer eventually wants this to represent about 10% of their sales. It's probably about 1% of their sales now. So that secular trend is just starting and will carry on sort of you know, higher highs and higher lows throughout the various ag cycles that'll happen between, you know, now and 2030. And by the way, those self-driving tractors and such tend to be a lot more expensive. So yeah, it, that's, that's exactly right. It's all a price bump yeah. on the original equipment. Yeah, it's interesting stuff. Um, then let's talk about valuation here. Deer versus its historical valuation. How's it stacking up? So cyclical 101. I am a great lover of cyclical stocks and industrials. You know, you typically traded a low valuation of peak earnings high valuation of trough earnings. That's just the way things go. Right now, Deer is trading at about 13 times 2024 calendar year or fiscal year, depending on how you want to look at it. That's actually, and earnings are expected to be down. So you're getting sort of a low multiple below average on lower earnings, which is a pretty good setup for the stock. Hmm, interesting. Okay. We always like to talk about what could be the um, downside risk in yep. a situation like this. And in this case, it could be that we don't see a rebound yeah. in farm income, right? So uh, farming, it's the weather, right? Mm -hmm. So it really depends on uh, U.S. weather, global weather, crop yields, things like this. So uh, knee high by the 4th of July, that's what the, car <laughs> what's what the, the saying is for corn. Uh, so it really depends on the weather. So another bad year in 25 delays this sort of upside that people might see. Uh, industrial investors never like to buy things when earnings estimates are going lower, but eventually you get to the bottom. But when that bottom is, is sort of the big risk here. Okay, good to know. And then let's talk about your one that you don't like. Um, and you sort of alluded to it. It is Caterpillar. Now, the stock has done pretty well over the past year. And people who don't know the company as well might think it's in farming equipment. It really isn't. It nope. mostly is digging mines and other industrial uses, right? Yep. But you say the orders are eroding. They're not doing as well. So if you take a look at the starting points of both stocks, right? Cat is up about very roughly 30% over the last 12 months. Deer is down about 20% over the last uh, 12 months. Uh, so this is a point in the cycle, like it's been tremendous. Mm. Construction spending in the US, tremendous. And right now, backlogs are starting to slip. Uh, uh, Cat dealer Finning, uh, it's a Canadian publicly listed company. It's a dealer, right? So you have a, this, this insight into retail orders for Cat machines. Their backlog in Q3 was about 2.3 billion. Their backlog in two, Q4 was about 2 billion. So this slight erosion, this slowing of orders indicates that maybe the cycle is turning for them. Interesting. Let's also talk about the construction cycle, which you mentioned, mm -hmm. non-residential construction in particular. Um, we're seeing a peak. So it is a uh, technical term on fire. So <laughs> about $1.2 trillion in annualized non-residential commercial construction in the U.S. right now. All-time high. It's the IRA. It's reshoring of manufacturing. Uh, all of those things and themes that we hear about and talk about all the time, that's having a real positive impact on construction activity in the U.S. Uh, infrastructure and Jobs Act, right? All of that stuff. 
And uh, that's great. It's great for Cat, and they're ha they had a wonderful year in 2023. But you always worry about when that's going to turn over and how much better it can get. Mm -hmm. So when we talked about deer, we've had a couple of down years. Deer is operating, or Cat's operating right at the peak right now. Interesting. And then finally, let's talk about valuation for this one too, and what's sort of being priced in. Right. So if, if if I ran the universe, I would like to see Cat trade at sort of a 13 time multiple on its 24 earnings estimates. It's trading at about 15 times. So there just isn't as much uh, caution or uh, cycle uh, thought among investors right now. They're basically saying, hey, the good times are here for Cat and they'll stay. That's a little risky for me. I would prefer it to be trading more like deer and deer to be trading more like Cat, essentially. <laughs> yeah. And then let's talk about the upside risk for this one is that if interest rates do start to roll over more meaningfully, you could see an uptick in construction. Yeah, so it's, it's rates, it's China. As things recover, that's good for CAT. Uh, should be good for deer as well to some extent, but that's good for CAT. So uh, the risk is really things turn out better than feared and that the cycle is longer and that the normalization from COVID, right, it isn't that severe and we just keep building things like crazy for the next few years. Well, I guess we'll see. And just quickly, disclosure-wise, do you have a position in either of these stocks? No, Barron's doesn't trade individual stocks. Okay. I don't own anything. Okay, good to know. So let's summarize what you're telling people here. Basically, buy deer based on that attractive valuation, benefits from precision farming and maybe a bottoming of the farming cycle. On the other side, you're saying avoid Caterpillar. It faces peaking U.S. non-residential construction and erosion of new equipment orders. Thanks so much, Albert. Really appreciate it. Both great companies, but sometimes the cycle. Yeah. All right. The latest installment. Thanks for watching the latest installment of Goodbye or Goodbye. Look out for new episodes three times a week at 3.30 p.m. Eastern. We'll be right back.
Ford announcing today it's cutting the price on its 2023 Mustang Mach-E SUV, the company hoping to stay competitive against Tesla as the EV market slows down. Yahoo Finance's Pro Supermanian here with more. Yes. Interesting that they're cutting this price and the timing of it. What's going on? Well, I just did a story uh, this weekend on how it's a good time to buy EVs, and now I guess I got to add this to the yeah. mix of a good, pri uh, very well attractive priced EV. So. Uh, Ford dropping the base price of their Mustang Mach-E to 30, uh, eight, 39895 which as you can see there, that's the, the rear wheel drive version. It's comparable to the actually undercutting the, the uh, Tesla Model Y rear wheel drive there. Uh, among other price cuts, also cutting the premium all wheel drive version of the Mustang Mach-E by $8,100 to 48895 which again, is uh, around the same price as the Tesla Model Y, the equivalent version. So really they're trying to target that Model Y is their, their key kind of rival in that in that space, that crossover EV space, um, you know, and also zero percent financing, which is pretty nice to have. Um, but we're also talking about a, a sector or a segment where it's it's really hard to compete. And Ford CEO Jim Farley talked about how it's so hard in this two row crossover EV world. It's just too hard to compete. And they might actually exit this this segment at some point. Mm -hmm. And also, they lost the tax credit for this car. Yeah, the that's right. This year. They, that, that's true, right? When did they lose that tax credit eligibility? So, that when was... the new rules came in place in yeah. January 1st about where you got certain components for your batteries and things like that, you would lose the tax credit. Uh, so, they don't have it. Only the Lightning has it now for Ford EV. So, mm. this is a way to make this competitive. But they also, Ford is saying they lost, we're going to lose $5 billion on EVs this year. Are, now, we mentioned in the beginning this is the 2023 Mach-E mm -hmm. that they're cutting yeah. the price yes, on. That's Are right. they coming out with new model years for this? Yeah, so Ford has said they, this is a kind of an incentive to, to get that inventory out of ah. the way to make room for the 2024. But this is a pretty substantial price cut across the board for these different trims. So it's a little bit of get some old stuff out of the door, but also maybe trying to move some product. Interesting. All right, Pros, thank you, my friend. Mm -hmm. Appreciate it. Meanwhile, Elon Musk increasing his ownership in Tesla to just over 20% from his last reported stake of 13% in May, getting him closer, much closer to his goal of owning a quarter of the company. While he's come under fire for wanting more control, Musk is getting support from ARK Invest CEO Kathy Wood. Here's what she told us last week. Elon Musk is the inventor of our age, and he is also our Renaissance man. So. Um, I, uh, I, I'm always surprised at uh, the pushback he receives. And I do think that that 25, he's not asking for any more economic interest, it's a voting interest. And uh, for many of our companies, we are supportive of super voting rights uh, because we know the visionary leaders, uh, we go through periods of volatility and they just need to be able uh, to execute upon their vision, not be thrown off by, um, by uh, boards of directors who, uh, who are listening to short-term oriented shareholders and swayed by them. And joining us now is a former Tesla board member, former state controller of California, and now founder and managing partner of the Wesley Group, Steve Wesley. Steve, it is good to have you on the show. And maybe I'll just start, Steve, with what you, you just heard Kathy Wood say. She's describing Elon Musk, Steve, as a, a renaissance man, inventor of our age. What do you think, Steve? you agree with that? Is that a, a fair description, in your opinion? Well, look, th there's no doubt he's built one of the transform making uh, transformational companies of the age, and he's done it twice with uh, SpaceX, but there still needs to be appropriate uh, board governance. What's interesting to me is Tesla's just had this extraordinary year, I call it the tale of two cities, where they produced 97 billion in revenue in 2023. They sold 1.8 million cars. That's more EVs than anybody, including BYD last year. They dominate the US market, 55% market share more than everybody else combined, uh, but growth slowing and everybody can see it. And they need to figure out how quickly they can get to the next growth curve. Right now, it looks like the uh, they need that $25,000 car up and out into the market as soon as possible. That's gonna be Elon Musk's best uh, big test. We'll see whether he can meet it. Well, and we know historically that he has a lot of balls in the air at once, typically, whether it's posting on X or dealing with all of his other companies or whatever other side battles he's choosing, choosing to fight at any given moment. Right now, uh, this struggle to maybe move the company to try to get more voting rights, is that a distraction at a time when, to your point, growth is slowing? Uh, look, uh, I think... Tesla and Elon need to focus on one thing and only one thing. 
I think 2024 is going to be rough. They need to scramble to find the next growth rave. $25,000 car, at least 18 months out. That may be a game changer. Might get them back to 30 or 40% growth. What are you going to do in the next 18 months? And I think they got three shots on goal. They've got the self-driving vehicle with robo-taxis, probably still three to five years out. They've got an energy division, which most people don't even think about, and that is doing six billion last year on the way to maybe eight or nine billion this year, going 50%. That could be a $20 billion division. And then they've got the global charging network because everybody has basically thrown up the white flag, if you will, signed a deal with Tesla to be able to use their global charging network. They've got to make one of these three things work to get the growth cycle back. That's what Elon should be evaluated on. That's what the board should be setting his comp on. In my opinion, it always needs to be performance-based. And Steve, I want to ask you, uh, switching gears here a bit, a different question. You know, Musk's uh, SpaceX wants to uh, convert its its business incorporation uh, to Texas from Delaware. It wants to do the same thing with, with Tesla. Does that move make sense to you, Steve? Look, uh, I, I have no comment on whether they should be in, in Delaware or Texas. They should be focused on one thing, moving faster, getting new product into the market that is lower cost, that can compete with BID, which is clearly far and away, full stop, their number one competitor. All the legal issues, the tax issues, the control issues. But generally speaking, you want to be focused on making a great product at a lower price and doing it faster than anybody else. Every minute you waste on other stuff, I think is uh, suboptimal. They've got their work cut out for them, and the Chinese are coming, and they're coming quickly. Steve, you know, even given your concerns about the growth trajectory, it's my understanding you don't own shares of Tesla anymore. You That's tempt correct. You tempted, as you see them go down, if you are optimistic about them maybe gaining in the future, or why don't you have them anymore? Well, look, long term, I think Tesla has a bright future. First, every auto company in the world is going all electric. And that's happening just because the cost of batteries are going down. People used to pay a premium to buy electric. It was a green premium. It used to be twenty, thirty thousand dollars. Then it was five or ten. Last year it was two thousand dollars to have an electric vehicle. Two thousand dollars more on average than internal combustion. This year, it'll probably be less, and it'll be less for the rest of our lives. Why? Battery costs are going down. So the world's going that direction. He's the leader in the sector. That's great, but. What companies get based on is the slope of their growth curve and the percent of gross margins. Give Tesla a lot of credit, 16 consecutive profitable quarters, but the growth curve has slowed. That's the big issue there. I think that's what comp should be based on is getting back up the growth curve. If he does that, Tesla's going to look like a winner. And Steve, in terms of challenges for the EV market, you know, you've talked about pricing. What about just the infrastructure network as well, Steve, that, you know, you'll hear in this country, folks will say it's just not dense enough at this point. Uh, no, that, that that is an issue of the past. There's over 100,000 charging stations in the U.S. I, I've been driving an electric car for 12 years. You used to have to really worry about range anxiety. Today, that's largely an issue of the past. And it's interesting. The two things that people worried about are, can you get costs down enough? And we're seeing that now. And again, BYD is selling EVs in the fifteen dollars to $30,000 range all over China, Southeast Asia, South America. That's why it's so important that Tesla get 25,000 mile vehicle out there. But it used to be about range and price. Now the issues that are popping up, interestingly, are in a whole different area, two whole different areas. One is, are different countries like China or the US gonna be continuing to slap tariffs on and you need to be careful about that. And the second issue is privacy because these new Chinese cars are well made and they're less expensive. The big question is, are European and American customers gonna be comfortable driving a car that knows everywhere you've been and might be listening in on you as well? There's a lot of privacy issues with uh, Chinese vehicles. We'll see how uh, American and European customers respond.
Well, we seem to be okay with everything else listening to us, Steve, perhaps, but we, we will see. It's a great question. Um, I wanted to mention that you are co-hosting a fundraiser for President Biden's re-election campaign uh, tomorrow. And there was a report in the New York Times a couple of days ago that the administration is considering relaxing some of its rules to limit tailpipe emissions, and something that is seen as perhaps a blow to the nascent uh, EV industry here in the U.S. It, it, are, it, do you think that's a good idea? Is that something you're going to communicate to the president that you don't agree with? Look, President Biden, in passing the IRA, is the biggest green stimulus in human history. It's pushing the world toward getting to carbon net neutral faster than anything that's ever occurred before. I give the guy huge credit and bring Republicans and Democrats together to get it passed. On top of that, more and more of the U.S. automakers are finally stepping up. They're building battery plants. They're going electric. They're doing everything they can as quick as they can, including building out that charging network. And if it happens six or 12 months slower or faster, those are small issues. The fact is he got it done. He brought people together in a bipartisan way across party lines, and it's making American workers and our vehicles more competitive than ever. I'm grateful to the guy, and Americans should be too. Steve, thank you so much for joining us today. We appreciate it. All right. Thanks for having me. And coming up, closing bell on Wall Street. We're checking in on the latest market moves and the top trending tickers. Stay tuned. There is the closing bell on Wall Street. So let's do a quick check of the markets here, find out where things are settling out on the first trading day of this holiday shortened trading week. We see those uh, major averages, well, at least in the case of the NASDAQ, finishing up a bit off the lows, but still down by nearly 1%, 9 tenths of 1% to be exact. The S&P 500 down 6 tenths and the Dow down nearly a fifth of 1% or about 63 points here today. Definitely a lot to do with what's going on with technology as the anticipation for NVIDIA earnings after the bell tomorrow maybe curdling a little bit or people taking a little bit of a step back, Josh. Yeah, NVIDIA down more than 4% today's mm. trade. Tough day for stocks with tech underperforming the broader market. Jared Blickery here with a look back at the day's action. Jared. 
That's right, Josh. Uh, tech, not only in the large caps, but also down the line to the small caps. Russell 2000, by the way, down 1.4%. That is worse than the NASDAQ, which was down nine tenths of a percent. And looking at the sector action in the large caps, only Staples uh, finishes the day in the green. And that's a Walmart story. That has to do with the earnings that they announced before the bell this morning. So did Home Depot, by the way. See if we have time for that in a second. But Staples, the only sector finishing in the green among the large caps. Tech is the biggest loser, down 1%, followed by consumer discretionary and energy, all of those underperforming. And when you take a look at the NASDAQ 100, you can see, uh, I'm not going to call this carnage, but you can see some of the damage being done here. NVIDIA, the flagship AI stock, that's down 4.35%. AMD down a little bit more, 4.7%. Tesla down 3%. And it's not just uh, large cap tech. I was mentioning small cap tech too. And a lot of the disruption names are feeling some weakness today. Uh, here we go. Roblox down 3.5%. DraftKings down 7%. Twilio down 3%. List goes on. Not a whole lot of green on the screen right here. Uh, when we do take a look at the Dow, we see some winners. Walmart finishing at a record high. I mentioned the earnings before. Coca-Cola all also up about 2%, Intel up 2%, uh, but not a whole lot of other dark green that I'm seeing. And then in terms of industrials, we're seeing Caterpillar down 2.5% and then Disney down 2% as well. When I take a look at some of the leaders, not a whole lot of green here. Seeing some uh, green in credit, both high quality and low quality, that would be high yield and low yield. Um, also, GBTC, that's the crypto, the crypto uh, ETF. That is my proxy for the crypto trade. That's done okay today, a little bit in the emerging markets, but for the most part, things getting uh, a little bit down to uh, smoked. If you take a look at the cannabis ETF, that's doing even worse than the ARK ETF, down almost 4%, guys. Thanks, Jared. Appreciate it. Markets facing a big test tomorrow after the close with those NVIDIA results, but investors had plenty to consider today with Walmart and Home Depot reporting, plus the biggest deal of the year announced. Joining us now, Ken Mahoney, Mahoney Asset Management CEO. Hey, Ken, it's good to see you here. Um, so all of that said, stocks ended up falling today. What do you think is going on here, especially with this sort of NVIDIA anticipation? Look, a lot of cross currents today. I mean, look, I think they were taking the leaders to the laggards. And look, it's about time, right? I mean, we've been running in circles where NVIDIA coming in today was up almost up 50% year to date. Uh, year to date was what, six weeks, seven weeks? It's a balance. It takes them back a little bit, as you said, after the uh, bell tomorrow, the video is going to post earnings. There's a little uh, air out after that. We'll see. But certainly, you know, if you look at the green and red, as we were just talking about, you know, the green were kind of staples. I saw some pharmaceuticals flashing green, some banks here and there, clearly coming out of money and some of the fast money, some of the hot money going to rotate. But again, liquidity is pretty high. Money did not exit the markets as far as, far as I see it today. I just rotated to the laggards as, you know, these leading stocks have gone up so fast, even parabolic, I would say. And Ken, with NVIDIA reporting tomorrow after the close, you know, that is the last of the that Magnificent Seven, Ken, to report results. Do you still like those names here? We really do. I mean, look, NVIDIA, everybody feels like they missed it. I mean, look, the stock is up almost 50% after today's shedding of 4%. I think its worst level is down 6% today. But the CEO Jensen of NVIDIA said, Hey, we're in a second or third inning. <clears throat> that's a pretty good, that's pretty good. Hey, you may not want to be NVIDIA in the ninth inning or extra innings, but that's a pretty long runway. Our estimation is maybe six, eight, ten quarters. We could see sequential growth. Again, the only problem that I think NVIDIA is going to have is not demand, making sure supply chains and all that stuff works to get the chips out the door. So again, I think NVIDIA, if it backs off, it, you know, for your for your viewers, I think it's a buy. And again, I listened to the CEO very closely when he says, hey, you didn't miss it. We're more in the second or third inning of this artificial intelligence revolution. Ken, I also want to ask you a little bit about deals because, of course, the one announced today wasn't the only one. According to various folks who measure this stuff, we are seeing a significant increase this year in deal flow, especially in the U.S., especially in large deals. What do you do as an investor with that information? What does that tell you? Well, it tells you that they hope to think one plus one equals three. Uh, they want to cut some expenses. Uh, also, you know, look, this administration is pretty much anti, you know, anti trust. You know, putting these things together. That's why today Discovery is trading about a fifteen percent discount. You know, it's not trading right there where 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 it closed. And, and I, I think the reason why, though, again, the pushback should be wait a second. 
we're in a global economy. So great, you put a, a Capital One together, you put, um, you know, in this case, Discovery together. You know, we're not just competing here in the U.S., we're competing around the world. And so, you know, we have to kind of get bigger. We have to kind of cut expenses. We do that through mergers. So, you know, it's two sides of the story. One side is, hey, you know, by these mergers, it's going to cost consumers more money. We don't like that. But the other side is saying, wait a second, we're not just competing here in the U.S. We're competing around the world, and we definitely need more critical mass to do that. Ken, thanks so much for joining the show today. Appreciate the time sure. and insight. Great, thank you. Coming up, shares of NVIDIA closing the day in the red. We're going to take a look at the MAG7 stock and get you ready with what to watch for from the tech giant's fourth quarter results. NVIDIA shares getting hit ahead of earnings tomorrow after the close. The company's shedding roughly $100 billion in market value. That's the equivalent of Starbucks. And the move on the results could be even bigger. Jared Blickery is here with a closer look. What's up, Jared? Hope you like some apples to oranges market cap comparisons, because <laughs> we got a lot of those here. Uh, I, I kid, I kid. First, I want to show you, this is one, one year's worth of price history. These vertical lines represent earnings dates. And what's interesting is the last two, we have really seen not much price movement to the upside. In fact, we have seen these mark interim tops in the stock. But you go back three earnings reports, and guess what? That was the biggest earnings uh, report that's delivered gains, market cap gains like that, to a stock like 
like this ever, at least for NVIDIA. I think it's one of the top five all time, and we'll check that in a second. And uh, one of the things interesting here is I was looking at the options activity, and the current price is $694.52. Well, we have options activity going all the way up to $1,300. And uh, if you're doing the math, that's about an 80% increase over the current price. And in fact, there is the most call activity at that 1300 strike price and uh, just going down there's a lot of interest all the way down to a thousand so there's huge huge bullish bets here uh, something like uh, 1.7 for 1.7 for every one bet uh, calls versus puts there it puts the put call ratio at about 0.82 put it that way and if it's less than one that means there's more calls and that is bullish uh, let me just show you. I was talking about some of the biggest one-day market cap gains ever. There is a 10.5% move that is implied by the option market for NVIDIA tomorrow after earnings, bleeding into the next day. And in fact, that would put that move at $177 billion. That would take the number six slot here. And I was mentioning uh, NVIDIA already had one of those big days. That was last May, $184 billion, that number four record. They could go for number six tomorrow if the option market is simply uh, correct. And then I was tracing out, I thought this would be a good segue into the race. We've been tracking all these companies from one trillion to two trillion, only two have done it so far. That would be Apple and Microsoft. Apple did it in about 200 plus days here. Microsoft did it in 500 plus days. What I did not show is Amazon and Alphabet, which are still ongoing, uh, they are each taking more than 1,000 days. So you'd be way off this chart here. Uh, but here's NVIDIA, it might get there faster than Apple did it. And in fact, if we were to draw Meta in here, hard to see there with that yellow. Let me draw a little red in there. If you were to put Meta in here, it just passed one trillion. It has already shot up quite a bit, and so it might take the cake here, but we'll have to see if Meta can generate that kind of, uh, that kind of interest going forward. Just want to close with a market cap look of the day. This is going to be the NASDAQ 100, and I'm going to throw our market cap numbers on here. Let's see if we can uh, get that up. Well, if we're not going to quad, there we go. Uh, NVIDIA, by the way, finished below. Amazon and Alphabet, they've been jockeying for position there. NVIDIA was on top of those three last week, and now it's at the bottom heap of those three today. Jared Blickery, thank you, my friend. We move on. The Biden administration has given $1.5 billion to global foundries to expand computer chip production in the U.S. Chipmaker expecting to create more than 10,000 new jobs with the new grant. For more on this, we're talking now to Technolysis Research President and Chief Analyst Bob O'Donnell and Futurum Group Chief Market Strategist Corey Johnson. Guys, it is good to see you both on the program. And Corey, maybe I'll start with you here. You know, um, big picture, Corey, uh, this administration wants to see this country ramp its domestic chip manufacturing. How does the yep. news today, Corey, this news from Global Foundries, how do you think that kind of advances toward that goal? Look, for people in the chip industry, this is a finally. We've been waiting for the money to actually show up. We've heard about these uh, potential grants. We've known about the policy implications for this. There, of course, is great fear about the, the international dependence on production out of Taiwan. And we all have the memories of what happened during COVID and during the pandemic when it was just hard to get those chips. Now those worries maybe are behind us. Well, they might be behind us, Bob, but, you know, picks and shovels, as they say, right? So <laughs> how close are we to actually seeing the money deployed and then some actual chips start rolling off the lines in these various places? Yeah, that's a great point, Julie. You know, I mean, it's years. I mean, that's the, the issue. Even with the money coming out, I mean, Corey's absolutely right. Everybody in the chip industry, in fact, I just interviewed Pat Gelsinger of, of, you know, of Intel last week, and he's like, I can't imagine I'm talking to you today that I wouldn't have seen a penny yet from the Chips Act. So it's a great first step to see this big chunk of money, but you've got to build the factories, you've got to train the people, you've got to get the equipment in. It's still many, many years before we see these chips rolling off the line. But hey, you've got to start somewhere. This is a big step in the right direction. Global Foundries make some very specific types of chips that are critical for automotive, for things like radio signals as well, for modems um, and 5G. So it's, it's a very important part of the overall supply. It's not a huge percentage of the world's global supply, but it moves the needle forward for the U.S., and that's absolutely critical. And Corey, you know, one other issue that's interesting is as, as we try to kind of, you know, increase domestic chip manufacturing, Corey, and the government's handing out this money, you know, you can hand out money yeah. to build and fill 
you know, these chip plants, but at the same time, you actually need people, Corey, to lead and, and work these plants. I mean, it seems like it's much bigger than just handing out money. I mean, ultimately, if the goal really is about domestic chip manufacturing, it's big policy issues too, right, about education and immigration. Well, I think one of the most interesting things to me is is that so much of it's moving away from Silicon Valley uh, to the rest of America. Now, Intel, for example, has been in all over this country and in, in well, all over the West, I should say, in, in particular in Arizona and in in Oregon uh, when it comes to chip manufacturing, and as well as all around the world. But you have Tyron Semiconductor coming to Arizona and getting some incentives with the Chips Act. You have this Global Founders announcement in upstate New York, of all places. You've got Micron in upstate New York. You've got um, other companies looking at, uh, to be in places like upstate New York. Columbus, Ohio, I was at the Intel, uh, the beginnings of what is going to be a massive, uh, at least $40 billion development in Columbus, Ohio, just a few weeks ago. So we see um, uh, the beneficiaries of this going to places where there are workers who are cheaper than they are in California to uh, ha do real cutting edge things and jobs that will be there for decades to come, not just the construction of these incredible uh, foundry facilities. And, and Bob, what do we know about how the administration is making these decisions of who to pick and where to pick? I mean, obviously, as Corey said, there is a cost component to all of this. But in terms of who is the companies that are receiving these grants, you know, is there a feeling that the administration is making the right decisions? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, look, the reality is there's not that many U.S. manufacturing companies. So the list is pretty short and we pretty much know who's going to be on there. Global Foundries is on that list. Intel is on that list. Micron is on that list. Uh, and then we've got some of the other companies who are outside of the U.S. who are building plants in the U.S. As Corey pointed out, you've got TSMC, you've got Samsung, uh, who's also building plants in the U.S. So I think it's sort of a known quantity. There is a question of how much each one is going to get and for what types of projects. Uh, but, you know, as Josh pointed out, too, it's it's critical, you know, the education process, the training process. Uh, there's a lot of things involved. You know, you can't just throw a whole bunch of money at it. Like, you know, Sam Altman seems to think, you know, if he has six trillion dollars, he can just make all these chips appear. There's a lot more that has to go into all of this stuff. And it's building those plants. It's getting that equipment. It's getting those uh, people trained. And of course, it's knowing which type of chips the market's going to need, because when you're doing this, you're planning several years out to what you believe the market's going to require. That takes a lot of very smart people who can figure those sort of things out. And Corey, you know, another issue for chip investors is, is export restrictions. And we're going to hear about this tomorrow from NVIDIA yeah. after the bell for sure. You know, if you're a chip maker, you know, Corey, you're, you're not selling your latest and greatest to China. The Biden administration wants to you know, slow China's chip ambitions. Is that a realistic policy goal, Corey? Well, I think what you see is is uh, two things. You, you see companies obviously not able to sell, NVIDIA is not able to sell their greatest uh, AI chips, for example, um, Grace Hopper and so on, into China. But they're trying to find workarounds there. And I think that most of the facilities we're seeing are not, frankly, at that super cutting edge. We see DRAM chip manufacturing being one of the focuses uh, for here in the U.S. and other things that are more commoditized, but will be great beneficiaries of being in the U.S. and being consumed by U.S. manufacturing. I think it's also important to recognize that politics does play a role here. And I think that that's one of the reasons you've seen a real careful, slow rollout from the Commerce Department here. They don't want another cylinder on their hands. And the Biden White House in particular, in this political environment, would rather be slow and careful than pray and spray. They don't want to just throw money out and end up with another uh, economic disaster on their hands. And we've indeed seen some companies that have gone under that maybe didn't have the technologies uh, that just didn't have the money. I said gone under. Companies that have pulled back or even completely shut down uh, manufacturing operations when they thought that some government money was going to come through that didn't come through. And maybe that being careful is a good thing, but necessary in this political environment when a single mistake will be pounced upon by political rivals of the Biden administration. Corey, let's bring it back to investors here, because yeah. should they be following these grants with their investing dollars in shares of these companies? Is that a way to think about this? Yeah. OK. So, I think so, absolutely. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you listen to conference calls from uh, all the major semiconductor manufacturers that are looking to do manufacturing, uh, 
it is increasingly a question as to when federal money is coming, when CHIPS Act money is coming, um, and has it shown up yet? I think these announcements are going to matter. I think that the competitive advantage, because the ordering of semiconductor equipment, to Bob's point, right, it takes a long time to build these things. If you want to get in line to get the latest and greatest uh, from ASML or, or from applied materials, you've got to get in line. And you can't get in line until you put some money down. And that's just not going to happen for these companies until they get this money from the CHIPS Act. So getting this money is going to give com companies a competitive advantage to get in line first, to get these factories built first, and to have the long-term earnings production that these uh, factories promise. I, I mean, thus far, Bob, to take the last one to you, to take sort of the other side of that, the money has not yet followed, right? Intel, one example, Global Foundry's up like 2% today, but it's down over the past year. So it feels like investors feel like it's still too early here. Well, I mean, and the challenge, Julie, is look, too many investors aren't thinking short term. These are long term investments. So, I mean, I think I think Corey's right. Long term, as long as you have that long term vision. But you know, with everybody focused on this quarter and that quarter, yeah, this money is not going to make any serious impact on the bottom line of these companies for several years to come. If you're willing to acknowledge that, accept that, then you can think about doing this because that's when the benefits are going to play themselves out. This positions these companies to have that future they can build to, and it gives investors theoretically an opportunity to take advantage of that down the road. Guys, I'm feeling so nostalgic. It's so nice to speak to my old pals, Bob <laughs> O'Donnell, Corey Johnson. Thanks so much. Really appreciate it. Much love. There's so much love in the room. So much. Thanks, guys. <laughs> Let's get to some breaking earnings news here. Palo Alto Networks just reporting earnings moments ago, and the shares down a quick 12.5%. That's because, among other reasons, Palo Alto is cutting its revenue guidance for the full year here. Now for the full year, says it expects at most $8 billion in revenue. The lower end of its forecast had been $8.15 billion. You see there the numbers for last quarter. Those numbers beat, but it looks like it's that forecast that is to blame for the drop that we are seeing in the shares right now. Yeah, that drop though also, I mean, the expectations for this one were nearly NVIDIA-like, mm -hmm. I mean, heading into the program. <laughs> I mean, honestly, even now I with love this that drop, as a descriptor. It's still up about 25% this year. It's up about 120% over, over the past 12 months. But they did cut their revenue guidance. Um, it's hard to see, I'm not seeing at least in their statement from the company, Julie, I don't quite see any color there about what's going on. The you know, CEO Nikesh Arora is just talking about growing cross-platform adoption, talks about the company's strong and unique position, their AI, AI leadership strategy. So I think you're going to have to wait for the call maybe to get a bit more color and commentary about what, what exactly they're seeing. Yeah, the company says billings are going to be up in the range of 10 to 11 percent. Total revenue going to be up in the range of 15 to 16 percent for the full year here. Operating margin going to be 26.5 percent to 27 percent percent. Um, so that's the full year. But to your point, there's not really anything else in here that tells us exactly what is going on here. Um, and I'm just scanning through some of the commentary from the leaders. And again, there's not really anything that tells us what is to blame for that decreased forecast. All right, well, Mr. Aurora will soon be on the call. So we'll see. Yes, we'll get that color. Some of these concerns. Yeah. Still to come, the latest earnings from the energy sector. We're going to check in on the Diamondback and Chesapeake Energy on the other side.
Well, the man behind the social media account Liquidity that has dominated Wall Street rumor mill has been unmasked. Drum roll, please. After seven years of anonymity, former banker Hank Medina has revealed that he is, in fact, the man behind the memes, and he's got big plans for the future. He joins us now. Hank, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. So my first question, Hank, is why why go public now, Hank? You know, you, you kind of, you were anonymous. Mm -hmm. You're obviously having a lot of success with that, right? A lot, a lot of eyeballs. And so why go public and why go to the FT, Financial Times? Yeah, so this was prompted by uh, a business insider piece that was, uh, you know, under, you know, just they were working on it for about, about a year. And um, no one was really talking to them. I was like, you know, getting hit up by a lot of people. Sure. and. I was like, why are they gonna post this if there's nothing really there to uncover? Um, and so it kind of just progressed and seemed imminent. And I had just released a, um, a profile, uh, lunch with the FT over the summer. So I thought that could have been the easiest way to just get ahead of it, move quickly and beat them to the punch and own the narrative um, with a you know, publication that I thought you know, would be more representative of my brand and not spoil the uh, seven years of being undercover. So I think of other sort of anonymous meme accounts and other types of financially oriented accounts out there. Think of Zero Hedge, which mm -hmm. I think we still don't know who that person is. Think of Goldman Sachs Elevator. Eventually, we, I believe we found out who that person is. So what has it been like to now be on the other side? And have there been disadvantages and advantages to being unmasked? Yeah, well, it's still pretty fresh. Um, the day of the reveal, I basically uh, just stayed at home and scrolled social media and had a lot of, uh, you know, just dopamine overload. Um, and then the next day I flew to LA for um, a tech breakfast that I was co-hosting. So kind of was out of my element um, from Miami to LA. So Wait, a tech really... breakfast you were co-hosting as yourself? Or as like, like how? Through Liquidity Ventures, which okay, um, was to meet founders in the deep tech space in El Segundo. Uh, so it's just kind of like not been settled in because I was not in like Wall Street or New York where a lot more people might have been, um, you know, a follower. Uh, so yeah, it's just been pretty chill. I've, I've only been uh, approached by like two people. Um, you know, one guy was like, hey, Mr. Lit. And uh, <laughs> I, it was just new to me. I'm like, wait, how does he know who I am? Then, oh, yeah. and I was like, uh, Hey. <laughs> yeah, you yeah. could be called things a lot worse, Hank. Let me ask you this. How from now do you, so let's like move forward. How do you mm -hmm. kind of expand, Hank, and build on this brand? Yeah, so it's basically, um, you know, business as usual. I've been uh, expanding while anonymous, uh, getting into, you know, my newsletter, which has already been uh, growing, you know, organically year over year. Um, and then also uh, expanding my portfolio of investments, um, primarily in early stage startups. Uh, but now I think as I'm a public figure, you know, just people know my face, I can go meet um, more VCs, LPs, you know, who might be interested in investing larger sums of capital, and they mm -hmm. have a face that they can actually, you know, put behind and a name so they can, you know, do their diligence. And so, and you're still running the account, like from tweet to tweet, post to yeah. post, right? So you're mm -hmm. doing that, you have a tennis or paddle venture as well, I understand. Yeah. You're a scout for Bain looking for a potential investment. Like, you're pretty busy yeah. based on all of this. Yeah, a lot of people ask if this is my full-time thing, and once they start to understand that it's not just running the meme page, it's you know having my hands in uh, investing in startups, in the newsletter, in uh, being a co-founder of um, Bond Life Club, which is uh, you know, a racket and wellness-focused um, private members club that's launching in the Hamptons this summer, and also Litany Partners, which is a recruiting firm uh, focused on placing you know, junior analysts um, into buy-side jobs and also you know, into investment banking roles. That's a mouthful, <laughs> as you can just uh, see. Uh, my time is you know, more than occupied and uh, have my hands in a lot of things, but I think everything blends in beautifully into an ecosystem uh, where you know if people are consuming the content or they're you know following the newsletter to stay in you know in, in touch with the latest news, they're also interested in getting a, a good job, knowing what their value is, you know what a fair compensation is, and then uh, the club component is now bringing that into like a physical component. Where they can, you know, network with like-minded people, be in like a Soho house. Although that's focused on artists, this can be a place that's focused on more of a professional, you know, 
type of uh, community. Mm. I have to say, looking at liquidity, the account with all the memes, very like Wall Street bro heavy, mm -hmm. and meeting you, there is a little bit of a disconnect, right? Like you <laughs> seem like a pretty low key guy, mm -hmm. which is not the image that one might have in their mind of the account. Yeah. Like how did you channel this to sort of be that guy online? <laughs> Um, it's just a persona at the end of the day. I, I like, um, you know, getting a laugh out of people and uh, it's something that a lot of people expect, you know, someone who's working in finance to be. And for myself, I was someone who always rolled my eyes when someone was like very loud and just like, <laughs> you know, very, just lacking self-awareness. And so I channeled that to play the stereotypical finance bro and it kind of just like took a life of its own but then when people started to meet me you know I'd go out and they're like oh you're the guy that runs that you're nothing like what you appear on social media I said good because I don't want to be that so yeah it's been it's been good and I think once people really see you know who the person is behind me or like my you know the brand then they're more likely to to work with me so that's how you know I've done um, you know, a bunch of the, the ventures that I'm working on now. Makes sense. Hank, yeah. thanks so much. Good to meet you in person. You too. And the real, the real guy, Hank Medina. <laughs> thanks for uh, having the me. The guy behind liquidity, amongst yeah. a lot of other stuff. Well, Energy Investors Digest, a fresh batch of quarterly results from Diamondback Energy and Chesapeake. Here with a breakdown of those numbers, Yahoo Finance's Ines Ferre. Hi, Ines. Hi, Julie. Yeah, and we have been taking a look at these stocks, particularly because both of these companies have announced uh, mergers in a recent month. So let's take a look at Diamondback uh, with its quarterly results, sales topping expectations, adjusted earnings per share, also topping what the street was expecting with $4.74 a share uh, when Wall Street was expecting $4.70 a share. By the way, Diamondback, which uh, announced that it is going to be buying Endeavor will become the third largest uh, producer in the Permian Basin behind Chevron and behind ExxonMobil. Both of those companies also recently announcing mergers. But in the company's shareholder letter, CEO Travis Stice uh, calling 2023 a great year for Diamondback, highlighting the company exceeded production guidance, returned money to shareholders in the form of dividends, share buybacks, also touched on that merger with Endeavor, saying the combination will create a must-own North American independent oil company. Company. Year to date, the stock is up about 13%. And you can see in after hours, it is also higher after these results. G going on to Chesapeake Energy, that company reporting its quarterly results with capital expenditures coming in below what the street had been expecting. It sees capital expenditures uh, at, for 2024 at anywhere between one and a quarter billion to 1.35 billion. The estimate was for a little bit over two billion. Fourth quarter results with adjusted earnings per share coming in at a dollar 31 uh, versus street estimates of 71 cents. Yes, of course, it is below though what it was in the fourth quarter of 2020. 22 because you had some tough comps with oil prices uh, and uh, natural gas prices where they were in 2022 and total revenue coming in at one uh, just uh, over one and a half a billion uh, dollars. Chesapeake also announcing recently that it is going to be merging with Southwestern, a gas producer year to date. The stock is flat, guys. Inez, thanks for joining us. Appreciate it. Thank you. Coming up, we're going around the horn and checking in on some of today's top trending stories. Stick around, more Yahoo Finance on the other side.
Hello and welcome to Yahoo Finance's group chat. I'm Alexandra Canal here at Pros Supermanian and Josh Schaefer. And today we're going to kick things off with Fubo throwing a wrench into the sports streaming service being created by ESPN, Warner Brothers Discovery, and Fox. Now, Fubo. Fubo TV is filing a lawsuit against the joint venture, claiming it will put a stop to its plans to offer a small bundle of sports channels and make the business more expensive. Now, Fubo is a sports first streaming platform, so mm -hmm. they are saying that this new joint venture essentially steals their idea. If you take a look at the stock price, it's down about 20% since this deal was first announced. Fubo is also saying in that lawsuit that they have been charged above market prices and that the creation of this service, it's going to de incentivize a lot of these companies from offering their products to someone like Fubo because you would think they just want to keep that close to the joint venture. But this is just a, an example, I think, of more uh, pressure that's going to be on these companies and more turmoil that's going to come from these new joint ventures, from these companies coming together when you think about antitrust. Yeah, I think it, to me, one of the main takeaways here is just when you see these headlines in business news and people get excited or maybe not excited, but sort of start taking in the new product that we're gonna be getting, you have to remember that the product isn't necessarily set in stone yet. And the fact that this, There's a could, lot of question marks. this could yes. potentially still not happen. There, it is not something that is confirmed happening on a confirmed date. There are a lot of hoops to get through here. And I think this is maybe that first reminder for just the general audience, the streamers themselves that might have been potentially waiting for this product to come out or wondering when this product would come out is there are large questions here that do need to be answered before we see this true sports bundle sort of come together. Yeah, you know, in that, in that complaint, uh, Fubo's talking about how they were being forced to air other content in order to get to the good sports contest. So that's interesting, kind of like twisting their arm. You know, I'm, the big question here is also, if it's going to be an FTC antitrust, is it, is it, is this thing bad for consumers, right? Is it, is it going to harm them by higher prices, less selection, less sports content? And, and was the FTC even planning to, to sue anyway? Right. We'll see. But I mean, Fubo is kind of jumping the gun here and saying, hey, we're, we need to do this, we got to stop this now, so maybe that's part of the Yeah, the and for consumers, pricing is going to be a big point there. There were reports that this service could cost $40 or more, potentially, mm. and you think about the value add, you think about what people pay now in order to access sports, probably a fair price point, but you don't know. People don't, we don't know yet exactly mm -hmm. how mm -hmm. consumers are going to respond to this type of service and the amount of money that they're going to be willing to pay. I'd pay the 40 bucks, I've said it. I know you would. I'd so, pay the 40 bucks. So do you think that Fubo jumped the gun here? Should they have waited to see what the actual product is? Or Well, well there, there's a lot of question marks, yeah. right? I mean, even when it comes to sports rights, are these companies going to bid together now? Is it still going to be separate? Again, pricing a big question mark. But I think Fubo's looking at their stock price. They're looking at their whole business strategy and they're a small fish in this really big pond and there's a lot of competitors out there so we're just going to see more of this I, i'm predicting absolutely mm. well we saw some of those media stocks have been rattled slightly on that news over the past couple of weeks but overall the stock market rally has been huge and a lot of retirees are trying to cash in on that since 2020 there have been more people leaving the labor force than expected and we're apparently in the middle of a second wave right now too. Bloomberg reporting there is around 2.7 million more people jumping ship and retiring than previously anticipated. You can see how high that number is compared to historical nature. A lot of times this number actually tracked by the New York Fed would come in lower than expected. I think there's a couple ways to sort of take this chart guys. One is it's not shocking to think okay as the mark as we've sort of had this market rally and a lot of people probably looking at their 401ks and saying huh, why not looking at the price of their house and all, all these other things we we know people just generally have more money than they did sort of going into the pandemic and on a broad sense i also look at that though and i'm just not that surprised that we weren't able to predict how many people were going to retire because what sort of economic indicator or anything in that realm have we been able to predict Mm. since the pandemic happened. It's sort of that unprecedented nature, I think, is one of the takeaways for me from that number. Yeah, you know, I have to ask, well, did we lose a lot of retirees 2020, 21, 22, when people had to kind of work more mm -hmm. and they, they saw their, their nest egg kind of decrease in value? Right. Did we, did we sort of delay a lot of retirements and now we're seeing that pick back up? Well, that chart, I think, illustrated that. I think, was that the dip? Uh, that you saw there retire. in 2020. Oh yeah, there you go. It there looks you go. like a, a little bit, yeah, yeah, a little bit yeah. of a stall, and then it picked up though through 2020. You can see Q1 and then a fall in there. 22. Yeah. So yeah. and it fell. Also, in, it fell in 2022 too. with what happened in 2022. 
we had a bad market. A bad market, yeah. right? right? Bear market, stock market sell off. And I think that sort of spooks people in some ways. But yes, Bross, I think what you were getting to, and it sort of gets to a general theme we talk about a lot here, is yeah. as we're entering 2024, it feels like people are starting to sort of re-understand where they might be in their careers post-pandemic. We're People are back to the office. That was something that was mentioned in one of the articles today. I think it was Axios' article that was talking about this number, saying, well, there's return to office requirements now, right? It's different mm -hmm. than working hybrid. If I was an older person thinking about retirement, but I can live not near my office and continue to work, versus when the email comes in and everyone has to be in three days a week, it changes the picture, right? Yeah. And I think that's part of this story too, is the return to maybe normal in some ways or what it used to be for people going into the office. Yeah. You know, it's funny, I had to go to a meeting up in Times Square today. <laughs> couldn't couldn't do that RT over, over there, couldn't do that. I mean, let me tell you, I'd rather retire than do that. But. Right, and if, and, if, and if you're someone who's already thinking, oh, I'm just gonna retire in two or three years from now, and then you're being required to mm -hmm. come back to the office and you're looking at your 401k, things are looking good, you're making strategic investments, yeah, maybe now is the right time to, to take a step back. I wonder how many people... I'll look into it. you look into it? Yeah. I was going to say, I wonder how many, many people pull like a Tom Brady and retire and then like come out of retirement and go back and forth. Yeah, we got to come up with a good name for that. It's the boomerang when you go back to your same job, right? I don't know what it is when you come back into the workforce. Yeah, I don't know. To make up a... The, We're going to uh, put pros on that. Is it, yeah. is it the back from the dead boomerang? I'm not sure, but... Uh, <laughs> finally, 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 I'm watching some interesting news out of American Airlines raising baggage fees and cracking down on third-party sellers of their tickets. American is raising price for the first check bag to 40 bucks from 30, citing increased costs. But also American says if you book, if you don't book through them or a preferred online travel site, you won't get miles. Very interesting here. A lot of, you know, some of these bigger players, these bigger, um, you know, your, your multi-million mile people, usually they buy from the website anyway, but what that means is what if you, what if they buy from my, my company's travel site and that's not part oh, that's of the mm -hmm. American mm -hmm. network, right? Is that gonna be a problem for me? Yeah, I always book through the airline mm -hmm. because I ran into this problem right around COVID. I think I did a third party and it's, it was very hard to get in touch with the airline. It was very hard to get your money back. So for me, I, I do think it makes sense to book through the airline, book yeah. through a preferred travel partner. But in terms of the bag fees, it's kind of getting a bit ridiculous. You, you want to talk Sorry. about something we were talking what? earlier in this segment about- $40 to check a bag? About consumers not having a choice, it's right? When prices go up? Insane. Yeah. You just have to pay. They could tell me my bag was 60 bucks and you would just pay it, right? Yeah, what no are you going to do? You're going to travel without a bag? Like at some point you're kind of strapped to what they say here and that's just not great if you're a consumer, right? Yeah. I mean, if you have status, you, you'll get that back for free, but it just kind of shows- Well, maybe you're... that's the play. Maybe they want get more people- Get more people, people in the membership yeah. program, right? Yeah, so right, get the right, credit right. cards, Fly get on American. the membership, which, which honestly, for 40 bucks a bag, uh, for as much as I'm flying nowadays, I feel like that's totally worth it. If you look at some of the competitors, though, Delta has a $30 fee for their bag, 40 bucks for the second. Mm -hmm. Southwest still lets people have two bags for free. I don't really fly Southwest, but I've heard good things. Uh, yeah, you yeah. know, maybe two years ago wouldn't be a good that's time true. to fly Southwest. <laughs> but you know, but in terms of their, cause, yeah, I guess actually to your point, that was actually a bad, the meltdown yeah, yeah, Southwest. Yeah, right, right. That was yeah I don't know, I don't know. I don't really have, I like JetBlue, I like American. I like anywhere that's not going to charge me for my bag. I like to bring my carry-on for free. So, right? so it'll be a foul, the Yeah, you guy. join the membership. I, I do think it gets you into those membership programs, though, and I think it's great. And point. I think you might see more airlines do what they're doing. Say, like, hey, you know what? Don't book through Expedia or whoever. Book on our site, you know, yeah, to get the miles. Yeah, what that means for those companies, too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. All right, I'm going to look into retiring instead of instead of the flights. So I've got to retire first, and then I'm going to need more flights. But as we take a look at that, up next, Less, we are less than 24 hours away from getting NVIDIA's latest earnings report. Let's take a deeper dive into what, what to watch from the tech giant. NVIDIA is Wall Street's AI darling. The company's stock price is a massive bull run, rocketing 380% since the end of 2022, and was the best performing component of the S&P 500 in 2023. With that said, here are three things we'll be watching for when the chip giant announces its fourth quarter earnings on February 21st. Artificial intelligence. NVIDIA is the tech industry's go-to provider for the powerful graphics processing units used to train and run generative AI models. Heck, Meta CEO Mark Zuckerberg announced that his company will purchase an incredible 350,000 NVIDIA H100 cards by the end of 2024 at a price tag well into the billions of dollars. 
Microsoft, Google, Amazon, Tesla, you name it, every company is clamoring for NVIDIA's chips. And those are just the tech giants. Smaller firms are also working to get their mitts on NVIDIA's offerings. And with the earnings season already showing continued AI investment across the tech industry, NVIDIA stands to continue to gain considerably. Market expectations. Expectations for NVIDIA's fourth quarter are sky high after the company stunned Wall Street in the prior period when revenue rocketed an incredible 206% year over year to 18.12 billion. In the fourth quarter, the company is projecting revenue of 20 billion plus or minus 2%, well above analysts' prior expectations of 17.8 billion. And Wall Street doesn't see the growth stopping anytime soon. Bank of America recently raised its price target in NVIDIA from $700 to $800. Goldman Sachs also raised its price target for the company to $800. It previously had a price target of $625 on the stock. Regulation and competition. Still, it's not all smooth sailing for NVIDIA. The company is contending with U.S. export restrictions, blocking the sale of some of its high-end chips to China, one of its largest markets. And while that isn't hurting the company for now, it could mean the chip giant misses out on potential future sales. Then there are rivals. AMD and Intel are slowly but surely building out their own high-powered AI chips, with AMD in particular gaining on NVIDIA's tail. That company says its latest MI300X chip can go toe-to-toe -to -toe with NVIDIA's H100, a claim NVIDIA refuted via a blog post. Even NVIDIA's own customers, including Microsoft, Google, Amazon, and Tesla, are building out their own AI chips, which could cut into the total addressable market for third-party AI chips. Still, those threats are relatively distant at this point. NVIDIA is still riding high at the moment, and we'll find out if it can keep the hype train rolling when it reports its results February 21st.
Let's take a look at what's trending after hours now. Shares of Teladoc Health are sinking after the company's revenue forecast for the upcoming quarter and full year missed estimates. The telehealth company known for the therapy app BetterHelp also missed fourth quarter revenue expectations by more than $10 million. Shares down 15%. And the company's CEO in the earnings release acknowledged last year's challenging macroeconomic environment. The shares are down more than 30% over the past year. Caesars Entertainment shares under pressure after adjusted EBITDA for the quarter also missed the street's estimates. Same store net revenue also missed expectations as the company announced an agreement also to acquire the operations of WinBet's Michigan Eye Gaming business. Those shares down about 1.5%. And turning to Toll Brothers, here's some green. The company topping earnings estimates. Total home sales also surpassed Wall Street's expectations. Looking ahead to deliveries for the full fiscal year 2024, Toll posting a better than expected outlook. It expects to deliver 10,000 to 10,500 units. The shares up by 3%. And now time for to watch Wednesday, February 21st, starting off on the earnings front. NVIDIA, Synopsys, Rivian, Fidelity, and Etsy all reporting tomorrow. Everyone will keep a close watch on NVIDIA earnings after close, of course. The last of the magnificent seven to report this earnings season. Stock falling in today's trade, but still up 40% already this year. And looking at the Fed, we'll have more commentary from Fed officials as well as minutes from the January FOMC meeting tomorrow. This comes after comments Friday from San Francisco Fed President Mary Daly saying that three rate cuts in 2024 is a, quote, reasonable baseline. And moving over to housing, new mortgage application data from the Mortgage Bankers Association. That'll get released in the morning. This is coming after a lackluster earnings report from Home Depot earlier today and mortgage demand sliding last week, giving us more insight on a housing market that remains tough for home buyers. But really, there's one thing that we're looking ahead to tomorrow. Is it synopsis? Well, you're looking at NVIDIA. I'm looking at Synopsis. We're going to be talking to the mm-hmm. CEO of Synopsis, Sassine Ghazi. Um, and Synopsis is sort of in this universe of chips that and the chip universe that could benefit from an uptick in AI. Synopsis, more an architecture and testing company, mm-hmm. just announced a big acquisition of Ansys earlier this year. Um, Only about 10% of its revenue right now comes from AI. But last quarter, we tried to dig into what the trajectory is there. This quarter, I'm sure that we'll do it again. But, you know, it's sort of interesting, as we were talking about earlier, as investors try to figure out where are the other opportunities to make money besides just in an NVIDIA. Yep, good question. Well, I'm watching... NVIDIA, yeah. Yeah, what a surprise. (laughs) Earnings on deck tomorrow after the battle. The last of the Magnificent Seven, Julie Hyman, to report earnings. Dan Ives wrote Wedbush out with a new note telling his clients he's focused on the trajectory of GPU orders. So GPUs are specialized chips used to train AI models and demand flow he wants to know from the enterprise. The stock we know lower today, but of course we also know this one has been a total monster. Expectations, I think we can say, are very high heading into the print. So it'll be interesting what they report and how the stock reacts. It's, even if it's good news, yes. when you have expectations like that, we'll see, we'll see how the stock right, and we. We also heard from Jared earlier about all of the app auction, op, blah, blah, mm. options yes. activity surrounding the stock and how that's also playing into especially what we saw today with the shares down. Mm-hmm. Um, so For sure. It's going to be fun. All right, that'll do it for today's Yahoo Finance Live. Be sure to come back tomorrow at 3 p.m. Eastern for all of your coverage leading up to and after the closing bell. Have a good night.